In this tutorial, we're gonna cover a bit more of modding BFPB with Industrial Park. So let's open our GF01 files. You can just double click one of the two files, the hip or the hop, and then drag the other in to open it. Let's hide the stuff that's getting in our way, SFX, Trig, MVPT, adding the textures like we did before. Um, there's one thing that I'm gonna do now which should make it easier for you when editing levels. We're gonna save a project file. So save. And we're gonna you can name it anything you want. I'm just gonna name it jf41.json. Now the project file, it has like an open instance of industrial park saved into it. So if you have this auto save on closing and auto load on startup checked, then you can close industrial park. And when you open it again, it's gonna look the exact same it did before. The view is in the same position and the same files are open and everything like that the textures so this is so you don't have to open everything again every time you're going to edit per level and you can save multiple project files as well so now that we know how to do that I'm gonna talk a bit about triggers and events let's turn on the triggers display um, the, the triggers they can do something when the player enters it, or leaves it, or while the player is in it, or if another object, like the bubble ball for example, enters it. You can make the triggers do all kinds of stuff, and we're gonna make a new one right now. So open the hip here. And as you can see, there's all the triggers in the stage. And we're gonna place a new one, so this is how we're gonna do it. You gotta turn on template focus for this hip. And when you do that, you can come here, right click the scene, and you can choose a template. All of these templates, they are items that can be placed in the stage. And we're gonna th go through each of them eventually, but right now just choose this sphere trigger. And you can hold shift, then right click the scene to place the trigger in the scene. So, there it is. Uh, this trigger doesn't do anything yet because we haven't programmed it to. So, you can click here on edit data with the asset selected to open this window. Or you can just press G, which is a shortcut for that. This is the Asset Data Editor, which is a window that lets you edit everything about this trigger. There's a lot of stuff here and we're not gonna need to mess with everything right now. Uh, our first focus is going to be in the events part, which is this. We have BFB for Battle for Bikini Bottom events and TSSM for movie game events if you're editing files from that game. So click on this box and we can add events. Now events are something that can be they can be sent and received by most assets and any asset can send any event to any other asset. So I could use this trigger to send an event to I, I don't know the stuff that's over here. There just isn't uh, like a, a fast way to send events to assets that are in other levels. It is possible to do that, but it's a bit more complicated. I'm not gonna talk about that right now. The events, they work like this. When an asset receives an event, it sends an event to an asset. So when this trigger receives an event, which we're gonna set as enter player. So when the player enters the trigger, 
we're going to send an event which is going to be give shiny objects so give shiny objects and so when the player enters the triggers it's going to give shiny objects and the target asset is going to be the player so you could put any asset here but obviously the only asset which can actually receive shiny objects is the player so we're gonna find the player asset which is spongebob and that's gonna be our target asset so we can just type spongebob here so when the player enters the trigger it's gonna give him shiny objects and we're gonna set how many shiny objects is going to be by setting this first argument here we're gonna set it to 250 um, the most of the event types of the game actually don't use any of the arguments and these are all going to be zero but some of them use like all of them so give shiny objects only uses the first argument which is the amount and you can set this to a negative to remove shiny objects for example that's actually what the the clam gates do they give shiny objects with a negative argument but we want to give you 250 when you enter the trigger so that should be enough for it to work we can save the hip now and we're gonna try in game to see if it works ah uh, the rolling green <laughs> So it seems to be working every time you enter the trigger, gives you shiny objects, but we want to change a few stuff here. First of all, I think this trigger is too big, let's make it a bit smaller. You can change the radius of the trigger by changing this setting, like if you set it to 5, it's going to be smaller, if you set it to 50, it's going to be like huge. Um, but if you want to, you can also set the size using the gizmo. So if you right click, you're going to see this gizmo and the position one is the one that's currently selected. So this is the position gizmo. You can use it to move stuff around like we did in the first video and you can move anything with this. So we can move this tree and the collision of the tree is not going to change, but so we're just gonna leave it where it was before you can press V to cycle between the gizmos so this is the rotation gizmo it doesn't really do anything on sphere triggers because well spheres they look the same no matter from which angle you look at them and this is the scale gizmo so you can click on these cubes to change the size of the trigger to whatever you want on sphere triggers like there's only one radius property so you can't like stretch it sideways but you can do that to other assets like let me see something you can scale this thing if you use the scale gizmo here like you can do this But let's focus on the trigger right now. I think that if you give the player 250 shiny objects every time you enter the trigger, it's a bit too much. So we only want to make that happen once. We don't want it to happen more than once. So there's one thing that we can do, which is add another event from enter player. So when the player enters the trigger, we're gonna send disable to the trigger itself so you can send events to any asset in the scene including the asset itself that's sending the event 
So when the player enters the trigger, it's going to give you 250 shiny objects and then it's going to disable itself. And after it's disabled, it doesn't work anymore. The events won't be triggered when you enter it unless you do something that enables it again. Unless you send it the enable event from another asset. And we want that to be persistent. We want that to, like, we want you to be able to leave the level and come back or die, and the trigger will still be disabled. So, to do that, we're gonna set this state is persistent to true. This means that after you've disabled the trigger, you can save the game and quit, and you can die and you can reload the level, anything, and the, the trigger will still be disabled. It's not gonna reset itself. This is something that is enabled on stuff like spatulas and socks. So when you collect them, even if you die or reset the stage, it's gonna stay collected, it's not gonna show up again. If the state is persistent, it's set to false. On a spatula, for example, you can collect the spatula and when you die, the spatula will be back there again. And we don't want that to happen. So if you're placing a spatula, you have to remember to set state is persistent to true on it. So let's save our hip. Ah, the rolling. Squidward. So the bus stop is this one. I wasn't supposed to do that. I'm gonna come back. So when we re enter the trigger, it should give, the, give us the shiny object. But that's only going to happen once. It's not giving them again. Because we disable the trigger. So I believe that's everything that I wanted to show you on this tutorial. Um, Thanks for watching and see you on the next one.